Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to welcome to worship here at Hively Avenue Better Night Church. Welcome to everyone hearing my voice, whether you're here in the sanctuary or listening virtually. We're glad that you joined us. As we worship our Lord and Savior this morning, may we experience hope and comfort and challenge to walk in God's way. Welcome to any guests that we have today. Uh, are there any introductions that should be made? Looks like most everyone has been here before. We're glad that you're all here. We'll take time for a few announcements. I'm going to call on Tyler Claussen for some announcements. Yes, the two announcements that um, I'd like to highlight. The Worship Commission is looking for additional people to help with the sound system and the video recording of our services. If you're interested in learning this and becoming part of the rotation, please speak with me or call me or email me. The phone, my phone number and my email are in the directory, which is posted online, and there's also a hard copy available of that. Secondly, if you are interested in helping with leading music or worship at some point, we are having a gathering here uh, after Sunday school today, probably about an hour. Um, just we will meet in here. Uh, Gay will lead the meeting, and um, we would be really like we would really like to see you if you want to help out with uh, leading worship or music. <laughs> If you look at all the other announcements in the bulletin, um, there are some good reminders here. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr.'s day, and we have a couple of celebrations in the community. AMBS has uh, something from 2 to 2.30 that you can uh, join in on virtually, and Goshen College also has some celebrations. So pay attention to those announcements and we encourage you to, uh, to get involved and remember the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and what it might mean for us today. Uh, the youth should uh, be reminded that they can meet tonight at uh, the Hess home for their usual youth meeting. And we have a congregational meeting coming up in two or three weeks on February 6th. So take note of that. I'm sure there'll be more announcements about that as time goes on. The purpose of that is to approve our new spending plan. Any other announcements? If not, then join me in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. From Bethlehem to Nazareth, from Jordan to Jericho, from Bethany to Jerusalem, from then to now, Come, Lord Jesus, to heal the sick, to mend the brokenhearted, to comfort the disturbed, to disturb the comfortable, to cleanse the temple, to liberate faith from, con from convention. Come, Lord Jesus, to carry the cross, to lead the way, to shoulder the sin of the world and take it away. Come, Lord Jesus. Today, in this place, to us, come, Lord Jesus. Join me in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, send us your Holy Spirit this morning and help us to focus our attention on you, for it is you whom we worship. Grant us a vision of your glory Make us aware of our humanness and our need for your renewing and cleansing. Thank you for your forgiveness. Accept us as we are and show us your face as we praise and worship you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is number, four, uh, number 34 in Voices Together, and Hillary will lead us. I 
I invite you to stand if you're able to sing together. It is time to light our peace candle, as we do each Sunday. As the coronavirus rages and political rigor dominates our news, and as news of disasters abound, we yearn for God's peace. God does not require us to solve all problems, but may he show us what small steps we can do to bring peace in our corner of the world. This weekend, we are reminded of Martin Luther King Jr. and his example of peaceful, nonviolent protest. May we learn from his words and his example. Join me in the litany as I light the peace candle. God of peace. It is time for the children. Beth has something planned, and we invite the children to come forward and join her. and girls. Glad to see you all. So I'm going to tell you a story about, uh, oh, you're looking at something here. Oh my goodness. But I wanted to tell you a story. I want you to listen to me. But this is kind of a distraction, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Well, maybe, 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 I see it's a, it's a distraction. So maybe you think we should clean this up? He can hardly walk through here. So let's all clean up, okay? And have you cleaned up your rooms before? See, ¿Ha limpiado sus cuartos? Sí. So can you help me? Let's get a basket. Everybody come on up here. Vaya, help me clean up. 
Oh, look at all this stuff. It's here on the stage, but we're going to call it the temple. Ayudame. Ayudame. Ponga aquí. Si. Cada persona. Toca cada persona. Okay. Oh, mucho gracias. Feathers. Oh, my goodness. So much. We are cleaning up. And we could almost say, like, we're cleaning up the temple, aren't we? Oh, great. Good job. Because I know that all the people out here, they would be very distracted. Or maybe we'll just keep something in our hand. All right. Thank you so much. Let's sit back down again. Now I can tell you the story, and you're not going to be distracted. But I'll tell you what. I'll put some of that stuff back on the table if you want to play with it. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about Jesus cleaning the temple, but I need your help. So this is what maybe they think the temple looked like, like the church that, um, that Jesus would have gone to where they worshiped God. And I'm going to need your help. So when I show you this, you're going to say, oh, no. Okay? Oh, no. Oh, no. And here, later on, you're going to say, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Very good. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you the story. Jesus entered the temple courtyard. His father's temple was filled with animals like cattle. Boo! And sheep. And kind of uh, doves. Coo! Coo! And when the sellers sold the animals, they were cheating the poor people. And what do we say to that? We say, oh, no. The money changers had tables and lots of coins. The money changers were cheating the poor people. Oh, no. People could hardly get through the crowds and confusion to worship God. Oh, no. Did Jesus, son of God, just stand there and do nothing? Oh, no. Now we're going to change it to yes, he did. Did Jesus turn over the tables of the money changers? Yes, Yes, he did. Okay, well, let's just leave that money here for a second. Well, just that's part of the story. (laughs) Did Jesus shoo the animals and the sellers out of the temple? Yes, he did. Did he tell the holy priest not to make his father's house a marketplace like Kroger's or like like Walmart? Yes, he did. Did Jesus want everyone to be able to come and worship God? Yes, he did. Did Jesus love everyone in the world? Yes, he did. And you know what? I think he especially loved little children. A whole, whole bunch. So Jesus cleaned the temple. So let's pray. Vamos a hablar con Dios. God, thank you for, that your son Jesus cared that people acted fairly with each other. Thank you he wanted all people to be able to get into the temple to worship. Thank you for the incredible love you have for us all. Amen. And you can go back to your seats. And parents, I'll let you explain how they use the animals for worshiping God. Okay, thank you very much. You were such a big help, and I will guess I'll clean up the money changers. And that was probably the way it was. There was a lot of cleanup after Jesus came. <laughs> For our confession today, I invite you to turn to hymn number 146, Lord Jesus, Come and Overturn. Our scripture and theme today focuses on the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, as we just heard from the children's story. 
We all have personal, individual sins to confess, but we also have corporate and systemic evil to recognize and confess. Listen to these words from this hymn. Lord Jesus, come and overturn the powers that corrupt and bind. Transform our temples with your love and cleanse our conscience with your mind. Pay close attention to the words of this song as we sing it together. Our scripture passage today is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. I will read in English and Beth will read in Spanish, after which we will sing uh, hymn number 582, My Love Colors Outside the Lines, and then Ed will preach on Jesus Outside the Lines. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove out all of them with he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, the temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people 
and needed no one to testify about him, test about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. Estoy leyendo Juan, capítulo 2, versos 13 a 25. <clears throat> Cuando se aproximaba la Pascua de los judíos, subió Jesús a Jerusalén. Y en el templo halló a los que vendían bueyes, ovejas y palomas y instalados en sus meses a los que cambiaban dinero. Entonces, haciendo un látigo de cuerdas, echó a todos del templo, Juntamente con sus ovejas y sus bueyes, regó por el suelo las monedas de los que cambiaban dinero y derribó sus mesas. A los que vendían las palomas les dijo, ¡Saquen esto de aquí! ¿Cómo se atreven a convertir la casa de mi padre en un mercado? Sus discípulos se acordaron de que está escrito, El celo por tu casa me consumirá. Entonces los judíos reaccionaron, pregúntale, ¿qué señal puedes mostrarme para actuar de esta manera? Destruen este templo, respondió Jesús, y yo levantaré de nuevo en tres días. Tardaron cuarenta y seis años en construir este templo, y tú vas a levantarlo en tres días. Pero el templo al que se refería era su propio cuerpo. Así pues, cuando se levantó de entre los muertos, sus discípulos se acordaron de lo que había dicho y creyeron en la Escritura y en las palabras de Jesús. Mientras estaba en Jerusalén durante la fiesta de la Pascua, muchos creyeron en su nombre al ver las señales que hacía. En cambio, Jesús no les creía porque los conocía a todos. No necesitaba que nadie le informara nada acerca de los demás, pues él conocía el interior del ser humano. La palabra del Señor, gracias a Dios. Gonna invite the singing group to come up and join me for this song. And we're going to sing together number 582. And uh, just to quick note, verses 1 and 2 are back to back, and then we'll go into the chorus and verse 3. Let's sing together.
Amen. Can you imagine the disciples that evening as they gathered? What was that all about? Who is this guy anyhow? What did we get ourselves into? What else is going to set him off? Daniel Clendon uh, from the Jesus Foundation puts it this way. i got to get this right. No doubt the disciples tossed and turned a long and sleepless night that evening. It must have been terribly disconcerting to witness Jesus unhinged, throwing furniture, screaming at the top of his lungs and flinging money into the air. Perhaps they ran for cover with the crowd. I would have. Did they look him in the eyes the next morning or shuffle their feet and stare at the ground and make small talk? I liken their experience to the crazy uncle syndrome who could predict the next outrageous act or violent outburst. I mean, the disciples, like most of us, may have had a particular image of Jesus. I mean, think about the portrayals of Jesus that we are the most familiar with. Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus and the little children. Jesus, the smiling saint. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild goes the song. So what do we do when we are confronted with a very different portrayal of Jesus? One that maybe looks like this, or this, or even this. After all, I mean, anger is a no-no, isn't it? I, I mean, I know Paul says, be angry, but do not sin in Ephesians 4. But as, as good Christians, haven't we been taught that we shouldn't be angry? I mean, wrath is one of the seven deadly sins. One, one article I saw even asked, did Jesus sin when he cleansed the temple? I didn't read the article, but I saw it. <laughs> I mean, Beth did a good job, but how do you really tell this story to the children? I don't know. I didn't check to see whether this appears in most children's Bible story books or not. I did w find one illustration for a children's storybook, which is perhaps a better representation than some others. At least there are animals in it. But let it, let's admit it. Jesus is clearly here coloring way outside the lines. And for the most part, we'd rather skip this account, especially us pacifist Mennonites. I mean, it shows up only once in the three-year cycle of the common lectionary, even though it's included in all four Gospels. So what did set him off? Well, we heard a few things. Just to say a, th a few things about the passage itself. As I said, this is one incident that's included in all four Gospels, although John's account is a bit different, as we might expect. While the three synoptic gospels place this incident right before Jesus' arrest, in fact, sort of place it as the cause for his arrest, John places it early in the story, right after the wedding in Cana. There's some argument amongst people about whether Jesus did this actually twice, which is highly unlikely, or just once, since John really doesn't pay attention to chronology most of the time anyway. Most scholars, I believe, suggest that John put it here more to make a point than to give any kind of timeline. In contrast to the rather quiet miracle at the, at the wedding, this is a very public display. And John sets the tone for much of the rest of his gospel, including Jesus' claim of my father, which, is, uh, which so enraged the religious authorities. It's also interesting to note that while John is the only one who mentions Jesus making a whip, almost all of the artist renderings of the scene place a whip in Jesus' hands. And while the text seems to be fairly clear that Jesus used the whip to drive out the sheep and the cattle, most of the paintings don't show any sheep or cattle at all, 
and show Jesus at least threatening people with the whip. While this passage is sometimes used to justify violence, it wasn't until Augustine in the 4th century who used this passage to justify violence against heretics that it was actually used in that way. And Dorothy Lee of Melbourne, Australia says in her commentary, note that while Jesus certainly overturns the money tables, he commits no acts of violence against any human body, nor does he harm the doves whose cages are not overturned. This is a symbolic act of protest, not of violence. Paradoxically, it is committed by the one who is the Lamb of God, the one whose sacrificial death will bring an end to all animal sacrifice. And Willard Swartley agrees, saying in his commentary on the Gospel of John, Jesus' action is a nonviolent protest against the economic desecration of the temple. The money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals became oppressive. Even if their profit was modest, the poor could not afford it. Jesus identifies with the poor people. <clears throat> While the activity in the temple was perfectly legal, and in fact necessary, it was also oppressive. People from all over came to Jerusalem and the temple to offer sacrifice, and rather than bring animals with them, they could be bought at the temple. Moreover, the animals had to be without blemish, so even if you brought your own, they might be deemed unfit, and so you'd have to buy another one anyway. And so, of course, they cost more at the temple than they did anywhere else. And animals could only be bought using the local temple currency. So you had the money changers who would exchange whatever currency you had from wherever you were from, usually Roman coins with a picture of the emperor on them, into the temple currency. They were, in a sense, the banking industry of the Jerusalem. And while the system was seen as necessary, it was also ripe for abuse. As Stan Duncan, the chair of the Jubilee Justice Network, says, however, the money changers were also corrupt. They would not only exaggerate the fees they had to charge for the transactions, they would also inflate the exchange rate. The result was that for a poor person, the money changer's share of the temple tax was about a day's wages and his share of the transaction from international to local currency was about a half day's wages. And that was before they purchased their unblemished animals for sacrifice and then had to buy them again or at an enhanced price because the inspector found a blemish or otherwise inadequate for the offering. And Duncan suggests it was not so much about cleansing, cleaning up the temple, sorry Beth, as it was doing away with the system entirely, which seems to be John's point as he goes on to the explanation that Jesus was talking about his body as the temple, something the disciples wouldn't understand until much later. But to return to my theme, what do we make of this Jesus who gets angry, who overturns tables? I mean, how would we respond to a preacher who came in and started turning everything upside down and berating how we do church? Not that people in church don't get angry sometimes. I mean, I've had people get angry because we tried to change one little thing or because they were upset with something that the preacher that I said. I remember one pastor who got punched by a parishioner on his, on, on his way out of the church. And that wasn't me. It was somebody that I knew about. We're seeing a lot of anger these days directed at many different people. But I'd suggest most of the anger that we see and most of the anger we see in church is more the anger of those whose tables were overturned, whose routine was being threatened, than it is the anger of Jesus. It's the anger of those who say, by what authority do you do this? Or how dare you? Robert Hoke of Sheffield, UK, begins his commentary on the passage um, by recalling visiting a store only to discover that there had been a break-in and the cash register had been stolen. He says, sorry, I changed that a little early. I felt for the owner. It's not easy to cope with economic loss as well as the feeling of exposure to potential violence, very common in our city. 
Still, it seemed to shine a light on how we can become so accustomed to a financial system, its familiarity taken as its normalcy, that it masks a deeper and more troubling dysfunction. That is, we are astonished at the theft of a cash register, but we feel very little or nothing about the brazen presence of poverty and inequity in our communities. I was taught, or thought I was taught, as, that as a pastor, I should stay neutral in most situations. But along the way, I realized that there are some situations where we can't remain neutral. There are some things that we should get angry about. As Eldridge Cleaver once said, if you are not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. I forgot my button. I have a button that has that on it, which dates me. Um, or the bumper sticker that says, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So yes, we should get angry. We should get angry when abuse happens, particularly abuse in the church. We can't remain neutral and allow abusers to not be held accountable or face consequences. We should get angry about inequality and oppression. As was mentioned, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And last Sunday, Jamie invited everyone to listen in to a program at the seminary about a project he and Akisha have been working on about the Benham West neighborhood. I've had the privilege of editing some of those interviews, the transcripts of some of those interviews, and learning what went on in Elkhart in the 60s and 70s as African-American neighborhoods were being destroyed and people displaced here in Elkhart. It's maddening to learn about it. And if people like Martin Luther King hadn't gotten angry, who knows what, what would still be going on. And unfortunately, some of it still is going on. Our financial institutions still perpetuate the disparity between those who have and those who don't. And the deck is still stacked. We should get angry. And we should be angry that the message of Jesus has been hijacked by the Christian nationalist movement who want to equate being a good American with being a good Christian and who see anyone different to themselves as a threat. And perhaps, just perhaps, there are some things we should be angry about in the church as well. Perhaps, as Andrew Pryor says, in our current rituals, there is deep love for God there is heart-rending dedication to God and to the service of God and to the love of all God's people on earth. But there is something unbending about them which we cannot see for all our trying, something to which we are blind. Like the Jerusalem temple which was compromised by Rome and by rote ritual and was being abandoned by the Essenes and others, there is something in what we do or how we do that means the people around us do not see God among us. We need our tables turned over. Are we willing to accept a Jesus who gets angry, who overturns tables and upsets the routine that we have become accustomed to? Garrett Kaiser writes, I am writing in petulant resistance to the idea that anger is an emotion with no rightful place in the life of a Christian or in the emotional repertoire of any evolved human being. The Lord, my God, is a jealous God and an angry God, as well as a loving God and a merciful God. I am unable to imagine one without the other. I am unable to commit to any Messiah who doesn't knock over tables. And are we willing not only to get angry, but to turn over some tables, to color outside the lines? Can we distinguish between petty acrimony and righteous anger, between misplaced indignation and anger as both gift and necessary? To quote Carl Gregg, a question for us today is whether we are willing to take the same risks that Jesus took to seek not only individual change, but also institutional change. This shift is both vital and risky. As Dom Helder Camera said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. 
When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Perhaps instead of the prayer of St. Francis asking to be a channel of peace, we need to at times pray a different prayer, which somebody, a friend of mine, posted fortuitously on, the, on Facebook uh, just last week, and I said, that fits my sermon. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. Where there is apathy, let me provoke. Where there is compliance, let me bring questioning. Where there is silence, may I be a voice. Where there is too much comfort and too little action, grant disruption. Where there are doors closed and hearts locked, grant the willingness to listen. When laws dictate and pain is overlooked, grant that I may seek to do justice than to talk about it to be with as well as for the poor, to love the unlovable as well as the lovely. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. And in that way, we can follow the one who not only loved the little children and sought the lost sheep, but overturned the tables, colored way outside the given lines, and was willing to stand with the poor and oppressed. May it be so for us. For our song of response, let's sing together, Jesus Christ is Waiting, number 287. Um, we'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5, and I would invite us to stand if we're able to sing together.